Now, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. So I'm very, really excited uh, to introduce this next person who's going to be talking about rootstock and smart contracts. I have Diego Gutierrez Saldivar. He's the CEO and co-founder of Rootstock. He's also the co-founder of Coibanks, the founder of Bitcoin Latam NGO and Argentina. He was one of the pioneers of web development in Argentina and Latin America back in 1995. And he has had a leading role in starting grassroots movements in uh, Latin America since 2012 and fostering uh, Bitcoin and blockchain technology. So can you please give him a very warm welcome to the stage? Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Um, well, an honor to be presented by Naomi Brugwell, <laughs> our lovely host. Um, the vision I'm, I'm sharing today, is, it goes a little bit before smart contracts, before, because I think we, we need to know why these technologies are relevant. I mean, why blockchain, smart contracts, and all these technology is relevant for our society. And if you, if you think about the last 30 years in our society, something amazing happened. Uh, a technology that connected every corner of the world that enabled us to access all the information in the world from the palm of our hands. And of course, that is the internet, which I call the internet of information. And that technology changed many, many, many dimensions of our society. It changed how the communications industry worked, how opinion was shared in our societies, uh, how we could access to knowledge. Before this technology emerged, there were, there were a lot of centralization points. You need to go through intermediaries to access to knowledge, to communicate. And now we can communicate with anybody in the world for free. And that's a revolutionary element. But there's one thing that this internet couldn't change, and it was the intermediation in the transfer of value or money. And very likely when I say that, many of you think, but you know, I use my online banking every, every day. So why are you saying that? I, I do transfer money you know, on every day on the online banking. The truth is that's a meme, it's a gimmick. I mean, somebody is pretending to send money over the internet, but what you are actually doing is sending an intermediary a message where you say, okay, please take money from my account and put it in, the, in somebody else's account. And you, know, you can use the credit cards, you can use all sorts of payment systems, the, bank, the banking system, the global banking network. But it's always the same. Money is not going through the internet. It's not moving through the internet. And these intermediaries have been in our society for many, many years. It's not something new. That's how, you know, in the ages of Marco Polo, we used to give him our gold in Venice. And he would give, you, give us a piece of paper with a seal that we could go to Peking, Beijing today, and redeem for almost the same amount of gold. So these guys, these intermediaries, are not necessarily bad guys. They enable the construction of a global society. They were the, the, the enablers of the construction of a global society on the economical, but also on the political uh, aspects of our societies. That's how representativeness took us here, and we could you know, coordinate vast amounts of the population. We could make decisions first on the city state, then in a country or in a nation, thanks to these intermediaries. We would give them our political value, and they would make decisions based on, 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 our, on that transfer of value. So this was a new technology, a new social technology. Intermediation is a social technology to scale our societies. But as we know, these technologies also have problems. The blank, the blank screens are on purpose because I, I'm fighting with a, <laughs> with a controller. <laughs> so there are problems in this intermediation, you know, because these networks don't talk to each other properly. You can see that when you use the SWIFT system to send money abroad. It can take days, you know, to, to 
settle a payment you know, when we know that money is digital today. So why sending money from Argentina to Europe would take a week? Why it would cost $25, $40 at best, if not maybe 10% of the money we are sending? Why? Because of this intermediation, because of the miscommunications between these networks. And that's also the reason why half of the population in our, in our society has no access to the very basic financial services. We are leaving half of our population outside the economic, uh, the economic system, outside of having the possibility to access to a better life because our systems are inefficient. And we know that time to time those intermediaries choose to serve their own purposes instead of serving the purposes of those who they represent. So we know that that intermediation also reached the limit of its capabilities. So the question is, why if the Internet of Information could transform our society so profoundly, couldn't change the way we handle money, couldn't change the way we transfer value between us? And the reason is very simple. Information can be replicated infinitely almost for free. I can duplicate information without cost. And that's what the music industry faced in the early 2000s when people started sharing the music with their beloved ones, with their friends and family. And they had to change their business model. They didn't find a way to, to stop this because information in a connected global network, it's impossible to stop. Information wants to be free. So it, it replicates fast. It replicates fast and free. And that's what I created abundance in knowledge and communications. So the question is, you know, if I create a digital representation of value, how do you know that I'm not going to replicate the same thing and use it to buy something else somewhere else in the world? How do we know that that $100 uh, USD, digital USD bill I, is not going to be used twice or thrice or as many times I want? And the truth is there were no solution to this. If you asked me 10 years ago, I would say that's it. That's how the world works. So we have to cope with it. Let's leave half of the population excluded. Let's cope with politicians, you know, failing our trust. That's it. That's what we have. We have to deal with it. But almost 10 years ago, something amazing happened. And that something was the, born, the birth of the first global network for the transfer of value without intermediaries. And that global network, it's Bitcoin. That's truly a wonder because this was something that couldn't be achieved before in human history. So Bitcoin, when I say Bitcoin, many of you think, or, or even with Litecoin, you might think, okay, but isn't Bitcoin a currency? You know, because it's, it's how we think about these new technologies. It's like we try to connect these new technologies with what we know, and currency is something we know, something we use daily. So the first thing we do is we try to connect it with that. I put the part in on because, you know, that's the cradle of Western civilization. But if you go there, you will see only a few rocks, not even that beautiful building. It's like, it's gone. But if you know the history, you know how valuable that place in the world and history was for humanity. If you don't know it, you will see a bunch of rocks. So the same thing happens with these disruptive technologies. The more you learn, the more you understand, the more you can grasp its true and profound potential. And this happened in our history many times. We used to think PCs were like very powerful typewriters. That was it, you know, only four years ago or 50 years ago. Now we know that computers are a little bit more than a typewriter. There has been like very brilliant people like this uh, laureate, uh, you know, economist um, that couldn't see the full potential of the Internet of 
information back in the 90s and compare the Internet of Information with the fax machine, now we know that the fax machine was much more powerful than the Internet, of course. <laughs> so, but it's okay. I mean, what I, my point is, it doesn't matter if you are bright, you know, one of the brightest minds in the world. It's very tough to see beyond these disruptive technologies. And it's also true that Bitcoin and Litecoin and other cryptocurrencies that have emerged over the years have proven to be very powerful global networks for remittances or payment systems. All these companies are accepting these cryptocurrencies because for them is the difference between paying 3% to a credit card or, or pay, paying zero, and for the end customer is paying only a few cents USD per transaction. So suddenly, instead of having an unwilling partner that will take 3% of your bottom line of every business you do, you just pay a nominal fee, a fixed fee per transaction. And depending on the network you, you use, you will pay a little bit more or a little bit less. So that's revolutionary per se. It's the first payment system of global scale without intermediaries and with a fixed transaction cost. And that's becoming more and more, more usual um, as, as we have more liquidity for cryptocurrencies in the world. So as more countries accept Bitcoin, Litecoin, and the other cryptocurrencies, this becomes more and more widely used. So this is a reality. And you can say that these cryptocurrencies are also a store of value. And maybe in the first world it's not so evident, but when you go to Latin America, to the third world, for example, where we had, for example, in Argentina, 30% inflation for the last 15 years, and this year we, we make it better, we have 100% inflation. So, so, yeah, we try to improve ourselves. So, you know, it's like, so when you see that, you say, okay, anything that is not related to the, you know, the bad policies or the problems of the macroeconomic uh, environment where I live will be a way to protect my wealth. And I'm saying Argentina, which is not the worst country. I mean, if you go, for example, to Venezuela, you are talking about thousands of, I don't know, you know, zeros being, you know, cut out of of the currency. I mean, people buy uh, bread with big packages of, of bills. That's how it works. And that's becoming revolutionary as well for, the, for Venezuelans, where families, for example, mining crypto, are being able to make a living out of that. Maybe making 30, 40 bucks, and that's more than enough to, to make a family live and, and escape, you know, the censorship, the totalitarian system they live in. So these are very powerful store of values systems, but we have to think in them in the long term. Because short term money, you know, fiat money, has the purpose of being predictable. What you want to know is that, you know, it will cost almost, it, it will enable you to buy almost the same things in the short term. But as I said, in the long term, they lose value. I mean, nobody in, in their sane mind would save money for their ch grandchildren in pesos. I mean, but, you know, long-term money like gold or Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies is money that preserves value over long periods of time. It might be very volatile in the short term, but in the long term, it preserves value even if it's not, you know, predictable. So it's a different mindset. And of course, all these technologies are experimental, so you shouldn't get a loan on your house to buy crypto, okay? Be, be conscious, try to expose yourself to something that won't put your economy at risk. But I said I was going to talk about smart contracts and I didn't talk about that at all, so let's move on. So what is revolutionary of Bitcoin is there are three, and, and Litecoin shares the same elements, there are three underlying technologies that are enabling this global transfer of value, this digital system for the transfer of value on a global scale. The first one is blockchain. Who heard about blockchain? Yeah, okay. Very few. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. Is, is this a Litecoin summit? Because, okay, I, I imagine everybody heard about blockchain. But 
what is blockchain? No, because it's like it looks like blockchain is everything. It's like it, it will take care of your children, feed your cat. It's like so powerful that. Well, blockchain. I, I did like a simple, you know, diagram to explain blockchain. So you know, in going through this diagram in, in two hours, I will get it to you. No, that's. I'm kidding. I mean, this is like what you will see is a very complex, but system way of depicting a blockchain. But if you want to take the essence of a blockchain, a blockchain is just a ledger. It's just a system where you can register events or, or da data. And basically, it has one, one specific feature. That is that each page in the ledger is linked to the previous page in a way that if I change anything in the past, I'm saying one letter in any page in the past, that will create a domino effect where all the subsequent pages will change. That's a blockchain. No more, no less. Is it disruptive? No. The blockchain without the other technologies doesn't have the ability to change anything. Because if I have only one copy of the blockchain, you know, and a hacker gets into that computer and changes the blockchain, how can I know that what was the original? I can tell that something changed, but I cannot tell what was the original one. So blockchain per se is not revolutionary. So Bitcoin added one other element that is the proof of work. And what it says is, in order to create this link or to, to write a new page on this ledger, you need to do a contribution of economic, you know, of computing power, which equals economic uh, expenditure. So you need to spend a certain amount of electricity, you need to buy hardware, you need to do an investment. So basically, basically, you have an economic incentive to behave properly, to fulfill the agreement with the network when you write that new page. You will, fool the rule, you will follow the rules, because if not, then you are not going to be compensated and you will lose money. So Bitcoin has a second element that is based on game theory, where people protecting and creating this ledger is doing it because they have an economic incentive. They, they want to make money out of this. And if they don't respect the rules, they lose money. As simple as that. So these networks are as secure as the economic investment they have in them. So there's a factor of economic security. It's not only technological security. And as I said before, if we have only one copy, even if we spend all the money in the world, then the hacker comes, change the copy, and we are gone. So there are other people saying, OK, let's create a federation you know, and, and connect these, uh, these ledgers in, in, in multiple servers that we know who they are. But Bitcoin went one step further, and Litecoin follows that path, is, and say, no, everybody can have a copy of the ledger. You know, anybody. Thousands of, of servers can run having the same copy, and each one of them will validate new information independently. So in that way, nobody can, you know, if I'm a hacker, I have to hack thousands of servers in order to change the history of the ledger. If we combine an open blockchain protected by a decentralized network, we are in the face of something new. That something new is the internet of value. The first network, open network, for the transfer of value. And as the internet of information was built in layers, and first we teach computers to communicate to each other, then we created protocols to emulate what we were doing in the real world, like sending mails. Now we have electronic mail. And then we created protocols to you know, share knowledge, and the web was born. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee created it so, so they could share information within the CERN, scientific information. But then, after many years, we decided to use the, the same tools in new ways, and we have emergent patterns, and created the social networks, and started like connecting and, and sharing information in new ways. In the same way, the internet of value will be built in layers. And Bitcoin was the first layer and then Litecoin follow, and we have also Ether and other currencies that are the store of value layer, the settlement layer. But when we do transactions, we also want to do agreements among the parties involved. We, we want to set rules or business logic 
in how we exchange value. And that's when the concept of smart contracts appear, the second layer that enables us, us to coordinate how value will be transferred. And Ethereum was the first one to do it. They did like basically building the store of value and the business logic in one network. And with RSK, what we did is we brought a second layer that will integrate into the crypto economies that don't have a smart contract capability, extending the, the, those capabilities and enable them to interoperate. And that's what we did with Bitcoin. We are already integrating in a two-way peg with Bitcoin. And we are in the works of doing the same with Litecoin. So, and then with other crypto economies, because our vision is that we want to create a network of networks for the transfer of value. So this interconnectivity will create a system that will be much more anti-fragile and resilient to attacks. Because if you shut down one of the components, the other ones will get stronger. So as a whole, we want this interconnectivity to enable all the crypto economies to thrive. And now as we, I think I ran out of time, but I will stay here until they kick me out. So, <laughs> so then uh, what we are finding out is that blockchain itself is not enough, that we need also off-chain off -chain systems that use the blockchain to, to do settlements, you know, to, to coordinate, to do the economical coordination of the actors in a decentralized way, but that can scale. So now we are working on payment channels. Well, Elizabeth Stark will come. She's the payment channel queen, so that will be very interesting. So now we are finding top layers that will enable these technologies to scale to the next order of magnitude. So we can, we can have like 20 times the transactions we have on chain, and we can lower the transaction cost also 20 times. So that's very important because now we are talking that we can serve maybe a billion users with the same infrastructure. And, and of course, there will be applications running on top of these decentralized net networks that will change many aspects of our society. And given that I, I already ran out of time, I will move fast into these use cases. First thing is smart objects. As we have a smart contracts and we can define logic between parties, we could connect an object, like a, this is an autonomous car, we could paint it as a cab or as a Uber. I can program a like on the wallet and every time a passenger gets in, a payment channel starts and they pay by the second. When the passenger goes down, the payment channel is closed and the car keeps driving around, roaming around, picking up passengers. When it's running out of fuel, it goes to the gas station, pays from its pocket and keeps roaming. And if we bought it collectively, it will, at the end of the day, it will distribute the income among the owners. You know, all, all of us who contribute to the building of this autonomous Uber or taxi. That technology exists today. The car, the smart contracts, the wallets, the currencies to do that. That's not future, it's something we can do today. Also, another thing that we are regaining is the separation of money and state. <laughs> so, <clears throat> money, do you know what all these have in common? All these bills have in common? The, they were privately issued. This was not a state base. The one in the Middle East from 900, it was in a Chinese region. So they were like, you know, a state by, you know, a group, a bank, and that was how things were until 150 years ago. But these issuers started failing people, and that's why the states took over, and we have what we have today. But now we have the tools to do the same, to regain that tool for the people with a level of transparency. Yeah, and they are failing. The centralized systems are failing. No, I mean, we can tell that as well. So now that these systems are failing, that you know, the gold standard was broken in 71, and, and we know what, what implications it had for the global economy, now we have the tool to go back to private money with a level of transparency that was never seen before. So now we are regaining the power of creating private money. 
And of course, you know, now a lot of experimentation around crowdfunding, which is immature now, and I think it will have not necessarily very good consequences in the short term, but it's being done, and when you are outside, I mean, the Silicon Valley has access to, to funding, and it has an environment that is very good for entrepreneurs, but when you go anywhere else in the world, access, access to funding for entrepreneurs is very tough. So this experimentation we are doing with the ICOs and everything that needs to grow and mature are still very valuable everywhere in the world because they can drive innovation to places that were, was not possible before. And as I said, this is also a social scaling tool. We had social agreements, social contracts, like the Bitcoin one or Litecoin one that have been enforced, enforced for many years without anybody disrupting them. And that's very powerful because it's a social contract that nobody could tamper, that nobody could hack for years and years. And social contracts that had a lot of value at stake. I'm talking billions of dollars at stake and nobody could crack those social contracts. Now the challenge is how we take these tools and enforce other social contracts in our societies. How we take these to other aspects of our society. And that's how we can scale our society to the next level. To, to last slides, and finally, the, the more, one of the more disruptive emerging patterns of the internet of value, that is the construction of reputations based on an identity. Now we have the ability to create a record and, you know, trustable record of all our interactions with society in the hands of the user, not in the hands of third parties, where I can have a proof of each commercial interaction I do with somebody uh, or every time I learn something or every time I contribute to my community and that reputational information becomes my collateral. And this is the gateway out of poverty for half of the population that has no car, has no house, has no paycheck, but they have impeccable reputations that now they will be, be able to prove to others and they will be able to trade and get out of poverty building wealth from what they are, who they are. So this is a very powerful tool also to create a true global society where it doesn't matter who you are because a state says who you are, but it matters how you behave. You will be how you behave. And if we combine this with the fact that half of the, the unbanked population in the world will have a smartphone in their hands by 2020 or 2019, we are in the face of a unique opportunity of creating a more egalitarian and prosperous world for everybody in the next years. So thank you. Thank you. It definitely sounds like a wonderful world, so I, I look forward to that.